we're talking about this idea, what should we name the baby? I, I hope that a couple of you took the time to think about um, how you went about getting some of the names for your children. Did you, did you think that through? Did you wonder uh, some of those things? It would be neat. I'd like to go back and ask my mom how some of my brothers and sisters got their names. I know uh, several of them had to do with uh, relatives and so forth and, and uh, mixing all of that together. I know there's, I've got one brother that just hates to have his middle name called. So, of course, what do we kids do? We call him his middle name as much as we can. Um, but I was reading online. I went online. I just asked a question. How, where, what are some stories of how people... Uh, name their babies. And I found a few of them here. I'd like to just read these to you. I think maybe it'll spark your, uh, your uh, interest as you think through even your own stories. But this one says, Asher means blessing. He was born close to Thanksgiving, so I wanted a name that meant thankful. And that's what I found. All right, another story. As a Southern woman, I love a monogram. My oldest daughter had a wealth of monogram clothes, bags, hats, you name it. When our second was another girl, I decided I was going to get some use out of that beautiful stuff again. So I named her Ava Lane because I loved it and also so she could wear Amy Lynn's personalized clothes. So, interesting idea. Um, we chose our son's name because, uh, or even before we got engaged, Henry Thomas, not after the kid from E.T., we just loved it. Years later, when I was actually pregnant, we threw around a few other choices, but in the end, he was always going to be Henry, and it suits him perfectly. Um, oh, this one, this one, you'll like this one. My husband chose our daughter's first name, and I chose her middle name, Wren, W-R-E-N. When we were trying to get pregnant with her, she was our fifth pregnancy but our third child, a wren built a nest in the wreath on our front door and laid five eggs. We watched five babies hatch and eventually fly away. It felt poetic to me. I knew, I knew if my fifth pregnancy brought us a daughter, I'd name her after those wren babies because they gave me a little hope. Isn't that kind of a neat story? And then one more. This one reminded me of last week's story. Remember we looked at how Isaac got his name. And remember what it meant? Isaac meant laughter. And that, here's this one. After one biological baby and a struggle with fertility, we decided to adopt to complete our family. Two weeks after bringing home our second adopted infant, I realized that the tummy bug I was battling for a week or so might be something else. I took a test, and sure enough, I was pregnant with number four. I held my newborn baby in one arm and a positive pregnancy test in the other, and all I could do was laugh. That baby's middle name was Isaac, which means laughter. So, isn't that pretty interesting? And the stories go on. There's, there's actually a lot of other uh, kind of neat stories, but uh, we'll just stop with that. What shall we name the baby? Well, I want to look at the name of another baby today in the Bible and then relate it to our Christmas story, relate it to the Lord Jesus and his mission for coming and so forth. Well, the name of the baby we're going to look at today is Benjamin. In fact, I think it even says it on there. Benjamin. But Benjamin doesn't mean joy and sorrow. But how he came about his name uh, brought all of that in. So, so we're going to look at that. First of all, there's, there's actually two names that Benjamin was given. Back in the Old Testament, remember Benjamin? He would have been Jacob's son. He would have been Jacob's last son, Joseph's only brother. Remember some of those, some of those details of the story. Well, when Benjamin was born, his mother Rachel was dying. And she ended up dying right after he was born. So she named him Son of My Sorrow. Uh, right before she passed. Benoni was the name she gave him. Benoni. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. But his father decided, no, we can't, we can't go with that. So he gave him the name Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Well, what's the story behind it? How, how did all that happen? Now, I've actually, I, I love the story of Jacob. And I've shared it with, with many of you a, a couple other times. I'm going to share it again because I think it's neat for us to think through these things. But his name signifies two different emotions. And really, in Jacob's life, there's the, you can see the two different emotions of this story. So I want to go back and look at some of this. And we're going to start back in Genesis chapter 28 as we look at Jacob's spiritual journey and how we go from getting a baby that was named Benoni, son of my sorrow, and had his name changed to Benjamin, son of my right hand, which would be a joyful name as far as that's concerned. So let's uh, look at that particular story. But as we do, let's open with a word of prayer. 
Father, thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for the things that we read in here that teach us about you. But they also teach us about the, the journey that other believers had to go through and went on as they uh, drew nearer to you. And we know that Jacob's story teaches us that very thing. And uh, we pray, Father, that you would open up all of our hearts to listen to this story today. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to look at this story. What is Jacob's spiritual journey? Actually, when you're in um, Genesis chapter 28, there's a little bit of the story that begins before this. We didn't even talk about when Jacob was born. And if you remember, there were two sons. There was Jacob and Esau. And if you remember the story, Jacob was a bit of a conniver. And he connived to such a point to where he got the birthright, the family's birthright. He was going to be the leader of the family away from his older brother Esau. You remember the story where uh, how it finally turned out where Esau went out to to, uh, he was doing some work and he came back in and Jacob had been cooking and he had some stew and, and Esau said, give me some of that stuff. I'm about to die of hunger here. And Jacob said, well, only if you'll sell me the birthright. And Esau said, well, what good's a birthright to me if I die? You can have it. Now, he probably didn't mean it literally, but that's what he said and that's what ended up happening. So Jacob ended up stealing Esau's birthright. And then there's more to the story to that. If you remember when, uh, when their father Isaac was old and was getting ready to pass, uh, he was going to bless Esau. And while Esau was out hunting, Jacob prepared food and brought the food in. And he dressed like Esau. He smelled like Esau. And Jacob gave the blessing to, or Isaac gave the blessing to Jacob. And then Esau came in. When Esau found out, he was mad. And Esau said, I'm going to kill him. Because this is a serious deal back then because Jacob became the leader of the family and he was going to inherit the wealth of the family and Esau was going to have to serve under him. And, and it was a huge deal. So Esau got so upset that Jacob decides to leave. Uh, his, his mother sent him, you go back to my father's house, go back that way. And so he's leaving. And as he's leaving, we pick up the story here in Genesis chapter 28. I want to read in uh, beginning at verse 12, and it's going to show us where God appears to Jacob and lets him know, look, I made some promises to Abraham, made a covenant with him. I passed that covenant on to your father Isaac, and I'm passing it on to you. God's going to work on Jacob. If you just pause there for a minute, you think about the idea that, wait a minute, the things we've seen so far is Jacob's a conniver. Jacob was a, he was a sneaky guy. He was willing to lie to his old blind dad who's about to die. And he stole the birthright from his uh, brother. That's the type of person Jacob was. And yet God says, I am going to pass on this covenant to you. Does that really make sense? Well, we've got to see where the story goes from here. So we find it in uh, Genesis chapter 28 at verse 12. And if you remember, this is where the story of Jacob's ladder comes in. Let's look at this. In uh, verse 12, then he dreamed and behold a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven and there the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. So Jacob's got this dream and he sees something's happening between heaven and earth and all these angels are coming back and forth. That's what he sees in this dream. Verse 13, and behold the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. And I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken for you. Now, God's making this covenant with uh, Jacob. But Jacob, being the conniver and being the, the person who's out for what he can get, you know, he's already stole the birthright. He wants everything for him. And Isaac's going to, or Jacob rather here, is going to look at it just a little bit differently than maybe how God intended. In fact, it goes on to say, Isaac says, well, God, if you'll do these things for me, and if you'll bring me back to this place, I will follow you. And some people praise him for it. I, I personally don't praise him for that. Because I think, he, basically, he's saying, if I get what I want, and you give me the things that, that, that I think I'm going to get, then, I'll, yeah, I'll follow you. I'll be your servant. Is that the type of believer we want to be? That's not the type of believer I want to be. And I'm sure I'm that way at times, but, but he was struggling with that. Well, anyway, Jacob woke up from his dream, 
He says, all right, if you do these things for me, Lord, I'll follow you. And he gave a name to the place where he had that dream. He named it Bethel. Well, in Hebrew, the word Beth means house, and El means God. You put them together, and he says the house of God. This place is a cool place. I come here, first night I come, I sleep here, and I get this cool dream, and I can see that God's doing special things. This is like a portal, if you will. If we were writing a, a contemporary uh, a novel of science fiction, or we'd say, this is a portal between heaven and earth. And he thinks, this is a cool place. I love this place. Wow, what a neat place. And so he named it Bethel, the house of God. He, he thinks that's cool. Now that, you know, that, that sounds nice. But how, what does it really reflect as far as Jacob's life is concerned? Well, uh, Jacob's going to continue on here. Yes, he's chosen by God, but what's going to happen in his life? Well, we're going to see a series of sin on Jacob's part and consequences that are meted out. And, and instead of life getting easier, Jacob's going to find out that why do things keep going wrong? And, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to challenge him in his life. Well, we've already seen where he has tricked Esau, and now he has to run away from home because Esau wants to kill him. So he burnt that bridge, right? So now he runs away from home. He goes and he finds his uh, mother's family, and he finds Uncle Laban. And Uncle Laban has these two daughters. And he sees Rachel, and he says, Wow, Rachel's beautiful. He says, he says I, I want to marry her. So he works out a deal with Uncle Laban. Look, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel in marriage. You remember the story? And so he did. He worked for seven years. It said his, he loved her so much that it was just like a few days. And when the time was over, it came time for the wedding ceremony. And, of course, they don't do weddings like we do. The, the lady had the veils on and so forth. And they didn't have electric lights. So he, he got married to her. They had their, their night of honeymoon. And then he found out, lo and behold, that's not Rachel. That's Leah. The older one. And the Bible is real polite about doing it, but Leah was nowhere near as good looking as Rachel, as far as Jacob was concerned. And so, so that was a problem, but he loved Rachel too, and he didn't love Leah. Well, he's got her. So the next day he goes to the father, and the father says, look, you work for me another seven years, I'll give you Rachel as well, but I'll go ahead and give you Rachel now. Just finish out the honeymoon time with Leah, and then I'll give you Rachel, and you can have her, and then you work for me another seven years. So, okay, they work it out. Well, right away, he's got a problem. He ran into someone that is much of a schemer as he is, Uncle Laban, which is now not just his uncle, but his father-in-law. And so he's got this issue with uh, Uncle Laban. And then uh, as time goes on, he's going to uh, follow other problems. And I'm just kind of reading this. We started chapter 28. You'll find all this in chapter 29 and chapter 30 if you keep reading. Well, now he's going to run into marital problems. The wives get jealous of each other. You know, I guess there's one issue with it. They say, you know what the penalty for polygamy is? You get multiple mother-in-laws. But uh, in this case, I guess he'd only have the one mother-in-law if, if she was even alive. I don't even hear her mentioned in the story. But he's now got these two wives, at any rate, and he's going to have problems. Leah starts having babies. And Leah just keeps having babies, and Rachel doesn't. And, of course, babies were extremely important to them back in those days. And she felt it very, very bad about it. So now they're jealous, and, and now they're kind of bickering with each other. And, and then, if that wasn't enough, they decided, well, how can we fix this? So Rachel brought in one of her handmaidens and brought her in to be one of his concubines. And then that handmaiden starts having babies. Well, then Leah stopped having babies, and she wouldn't have that, so she goes and gets one of her handmaids and brings it in. And so now he's got these two concubines and these two wives. Basically, he's got four wives, and they're having babies, and they're kind of going back and forth. And it's a real problem. You find out that, that this is not fun. Life is just not enjoyable. This wasn't the story Jacob had in mind when he saw Rachel and this girl that he fell in love with and we would, we would walk off into the sunset with each other. No, that's, that's not the way it's happening. Uh, they're having lots of different issues. And, and the Bible even shares a couple other stories of, of problems where they start trading him back and forth and, and he feels kind of used, you know. Uh, he was supposed to be with Rachel one night and, and Rachel wanted something that one of Leah's sons found uh, like it was like some sort of salad or something that he found out in the field and so they traded and then Jacob had to go to over here and, and it's just life is not so much fun for him at that point in time so he had those problems uh, then 
uh, there was uh, the story of deceitfulness that he had with his father-in-law. The father-in-law decided, how am I going to pay Jacob now? He says, I tell you what, I've got all these, these sheep, and they refer to them as cattle because they're herds. And he said, I've got all these sheep and goats and so forth. And what we'll do is uh, you keep any of them that are born spotted or speckled because they're, they're less valuable. But I'll let you keep them. And I'll keep all the ones that are born that look nice. You know, the real nice white looking sheep or, or goats or however that goes. And so Jacob says, okay, well, Jacob had a scheme uh, in dealing with the way that they mated so that the only ones that were mating were the spotted and speckled and striped ones. And so pretty soon, Uncle Laban's flocks are actually getting smaller and Jacob's flocks are getting larger. Well, what do you think that that does within the family dynamic? Now they've got a bigger problem. These guys are trying to out-scheme each other, and it's just not working. And uh, so um, Jacob ends up, it's just a problem. He can tell, boy, all, all these different issues. Uh, it, it's a vicious cycle. I'm, I'm now in chapter 31, actually. And in uh, chapter 31, let me read verse 7, what it says here. In uh, 31 verse 7, it says, uh, he's talking to his wives. He says, yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. So he's, he's starting to see, even though all these things are going wrong, God is still taking care of us. But your, your father, my wives, your father is, is cheating us. And he's doing all these things. So they decide to run. They decide to leave. Kind of the story of Jacob's life so far. He lives in one place so long that he makes himself odious to the people he's with, like he did with his brother Esau, and had to run away from Esau. So now he's kind of getting that way with Uncle Laban. And by the way, Uncle Laban had sons, adult sons, that were also working with the flocks, and they were feeling the stress of all this. So now Jacob's like, let's just get out of here. Let's run. So they decide to sneak away and leave. But uh, an interesting thing happens. As they're leaving, go down to chapter 31 and verse 19. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. Now, you might be thinking, household idols? How, how do idols get into this, and why would Rachel want them? Why would, why would uh, Jacob even want them once he finds out, and yet he, he, they kept them for a while? What's it all about? Well, this is more than just idolatry, if you will. These household idols were used for a couple different things back in those days. One of the things they were used for was they were like deeds to property. Or, if you will, whoever had the father's household idols is the one who would inherit the, the headship of the family after the father left. And so uh, Rachel saw these things and she wanted them. So she got them, and now uh, Jacob's got them, and Jacob basically now is heir to the household. That's why when you find in this story a little bit later, as they're running away, that Laban goes fleeing after him, and Laban's sons are with him, and they want blood. They can't believe this conniving thief. They've run, and we need to go get it back from them because we're talking the deeds to their property. We're talking the headship to the family. So that's why they were so interested. They weren't trying to protect idols, and it wasn't a religious idea per se. It was more of what they signified materially. And that's what they were going after. So Rachel stole those. And, and so now uh, Laban is coming after them. And, and Jacob sees that they're coming. Well, while they're leaving, they're fleeing, and Laban and them are coming behind him, someone comes and tells them, guess who's coming to meet you? Your brother Esau. And Esau's got 400 men with him. Think about this. He's got Laban and his sons and all them behind him really mad about the theft of these idols. And he's got Esau and 400 men really mad that because he stole the birthrights to the family there. And he's caught in the middle. What a terrible time. And, and everything is just kind of snowballing all around him. Even though God had protected him and, and he noticed it, it's still snowballing around him. Now, about this time, he also had some tragic things happen within his family. As, as they're on the run, and they're in between Laban and in between Esau, uh, as they're going, uh, they're passing by some towns, and his daughter Dinah was raped. 
Uh, one of the boys there saw her and took a fancy to her and brought her in and, and raped her. And so then two of his sons, Simeon and Levi, who were Dinah's brothers, remember there were four mothers, so they're, they're mixed families here, but they were actually her brothers. And uh, they got so upset about it, they, they created kind of a plan because they had been given the, the mark of the covenant, they had been circumcised. And so they told the people of this town, look, the men, if the men will be circumcised, we'll work out a deal with you to where you can have our, our sister and we'll take your uh, girls for our wives as well and, and all that. So they did that, but while they were in the midst of healing up, they were really sore, Levi and, and was it Levi and Simeon, make sure I get the names right, Levi and Simeon attacked and murdered all the men of the city. Wow. Jacob finds out and guess what Jacob does? He doesn't go, way to go guys, show them who's boss. No. Jacob says, now every town around here is going to want to kill us. Because every town around here is going to think that we're a murdering tribe of gypsies or whatever. And they're going to think that we're a danger to them. And they're going to come out and they're going to attack us. What have you done? I hope you're kind of getting a picture of the story as it's unfolding. Jacob told the Lord, well, yeah, Lord, if you'll do these things for me, I'll follow you. And then as he runs, he continues to connive. Apparently his wives picked up on it, and now they're conniving as well. And even his sons are, everybody's just, they're just doing things that aren't right, and it's creating problems, and it's creating issues, and this is piling up on top of him. He's got Uncle Laban and the brother-in-laws coming from one side. He's got Esau and the 400 coming from the other side. And it's just, it's a problem. And there, there's other parts of the story I'm just not going to take the time to share right now. But it's, it's a problem. There's issues here. And it brings us up to chapter 35. If you go to chapter 35, I think God allowed the issues to happen. So that Jacob would see, I can't do this. If any of this is going to happen, God has to do it. And so Jacob's faced, he's at, he's at a crossroad, if you will. And he's going to have to decide, live for myself, selfishly, sinfully, or follow this God who made a covenant with my grandfather, a covenant with my father, and now he's made this covenant with me. Follow him and allow God's plans to unfold. By the way, it's during this time while he's waiting, he's in between both of these groups, that he has that story about that wrestling match where he wrestles with the angel of the Lord and, and his, he ends up hurting his hip and, and that's where his name is changed to Israel and so forth, which means he wrestles with God. It's kind of the idea there. So um, at any rate, all that's happening and Jacob's starting to wake up to what's going on. Look at chapter 35, beginning at verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. Remember Bethel? That's where he had that dream with the ladder going to heaven. Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me in the way in which I have gone. Funny, he notices, even with all the trouble he's brought on himself, that God has still preserved him. Verse 4, So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terameth tree, which is by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So God is still protecting them, even though these cities are afraid that they might come and, and mess with them. But there appears, this appears to be a, a situation in Jacob's life where Jacob repents, where Jacob turns to the Lord. And he decides, I'm not going to keep living my way anymore. I'm going to live God's way. I'm going to do it God's way. And that's why he told them even the idea of getting rid of these, these deeds to property that we have that don't belong to us. I, I, I often wonder. I don't hear about them anymore. I, at least I can't remember if, if they're recorded in there. But if he gives them back to Laban and to Laban's sons later. I'm, I'm not sure if he ever does. But he gets rid of them. From as far as he and his family is concerned, they get rid of them and they, they clean themselves up. It's interesting that he says, take the earrings out of your ears, change your clothes and so forth. 
again, it doesn't give a lot of explanation to why all that, except that I'm thinking that Jacob says, look, we're living just like the world around us and what's it done for us? Let's live for God. Let's follow God. And so they clean themselves up as they get ready to go and make this altar to God. But an interesting thing happens. Let me keep reading here in chapter 35. I want to read verse 6 and 7. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now think this through for a minute. When he was first there and he had this dream and God said, I'm going to do all these things for you. And he said, yeah, if you do all that for me, I'll follow you. And he named the place Bethel, house of God. What a neat place. This is a cool place. I love this place. Now he changed the name to El Bethel. Remember I said El means God? Now he changed the name to the God of the house of God. Get what's happening. I, I think this is what's happening in Jacob's heart. He's no longer enthralled with the place. Wow, what a cool place. What's neat. I get cool dreams here. He's not enthralled with that anymore. He's not enthralled with all, even all the, the promises of, of the things that God will give him. He's enthralled with God. The God of the house of God. That's where his, his thinking changed. And he realized, look what God has done for him. God has preserved us. God has protected us. God has a plan. And God is working out that plan so that I am going to follow the God of the house of God. I'm not just looking for a good luck charm, this, this cool place. Come back here whenever I need something. You know, it's almost like going back to that genie in the bottle and rub it every time you need things. By the way, there's a lot of Christians that treat God like that. They think that if you pray or you get enough people to agree with you in prayer that you'll get what you want. It's almost like God's arm is behind his back and because you prayed it, he has to give it to you now. No. We're not enthralled with that good luck charm. We're not enthralled with that thing. We're enthralled with God himself. And that's what Jacob had. I believe that this is a, a watershed moment in Jacob's life. And in fact, as you follow the story from here, God keeps working in Jacob's life and how God then works through his children and so forth. Remember, Joseph is the one who comes uh, from him as well, and, and, and how all of that works toward getting the children of Israel into Egypt so that God can eventually take them to the promised land. But he's going to submit to God's plan. It's God who he's enthralled with. It's not all of the other things. Think about the things that, uh, that we can have in, in our lives that, uh, that um, draw our attentions rather than following God. You know, uh, wh whether it's religious relics, you know, you can, you can have a cross. Well, you almost look at the cross as if it's my good luck charm. You know, you, you can have other things. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong, by the way, with having a cross on jewelry. I, I, I really don't have a problem with that at all. But what are people trusting in? What are the things that they're trusting in? Remember me sharing a story down in Alabama? People always said, every time a tornado comes through and tears that house up, there's the coffee table with the Bible on, and it's still sitting there. Well, I saw plenty of houses get torn up by tornadoes, and I never saw a coffee table left with a Bible on it. You know, uh, tape the Bibles all over your body so that you don't get destroyed, right? I, just, I mean, just weird, weird thinking like that. Well, not Jacob anymore. Jacob is enthralled with God. Well, in the process of all this, Rachel is expecting their next child. And we see that. Let me uh, keep reading in chapter 35. Go down to verse 16. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when, there, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, and Benoni means son of my sorrow, but his father called him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Isn't that interesting uh, where that all goes up? It says, and Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. So she had this son, and from her perspective, when she had this son, I don't know if she's still thinking about all the difficulties God had brought them through. I'm not really sure how her heart has changed to the Lord. Uh, maybe it did, and she's just expressing the, uh, the difficulties of this childbirth and how, what it's done to her mental state. Maybe she never really did start walking with the Lord. We, we just don't have it recorded. 
so that we know. But at any rate, it was a difficult time, and she named him a name that just reminded them and would have reminded anyone else who heard it of the sorrow and the difficulty. Jacob's point of view was different, though. God has started doing things in his life. He, was, he had just recently had this time of revival, and now he's following the Lord. And so joy had reentered his life. Instead of all of the, the, the struggling for all the things that I want and so forth, joy had entered his life. So he wanted the son of, the, of this, the name of this baby to reflect the joy that was there. And therefore, he named him Benjamin, son of my right hand. It, it kind of gives the idea of a, of a father sitting on a chair and the son standing right next to him. You know, it's just a, kind of a loving picture, a family picture, if you want to put it that way. And that's how God kind of looked at it. If you remember, Jacob was, or Benjamin was extremely important to him. Remember later in later years when uh, Joseph, by the way, Joseph and Benjamin were brothers. They were the only two born to their mother. And uh, when Joseph got sent away in captivity, Jacob wasn't about to let Benjamin go at all. And, you're, and you remember that whole story. Maybe we'll look at that later of uh, Joseph being in Egypt and wanting Benjamin to come. And, and so it, it, it was obvious that he loved this son, Benjamin. And he wasn't going to let anything happen to him. So there's a real difference here as you look at it. The story of Benjamin brings up two different emotions. The one emotion is the emotion of difficulty. The difficulty of life, the difficulty that sin brings in, into your lives, and even the difficulty of a, of, a, of a bad birth where the mother dies. But the name Benjamin brings about another emotion, and that's the emotion of God finally getting a hold of someone, God bringing joy into their life, and even in the presence of difficult circumstances, there was still reason to rejoice and reason to have those things. And that's where you find the name of Benjamin. Now, I want to take all that and I want to tie it into Christmas. Because, of course, we're talking at Christmas. The baby we're talking about is Jesus. When Jesus was born, and we think about naming him, and we even read a passage from Luke chapter 1 about where Mary was told that his name was going to be Jesus. But do you realize that when you talk about Jesus coming at Christmas, if you're really thinking the story through, there's two different emotions, really, that should arise. Maybe more emotions than that, but at least two emotions. The one emotion is the, the wonderfulness of the story, right? The, wonder, the wonderfulness of the Savior coming and being born. Uh, the wonderfulness that God has, has sent a gift and God has provided and so forth. But it should also bring another emotion, because when you see the story of the baby at Christmas, you should also look to the story of Easter, where the man went to the cross. That's why he came. That's why Jesus came. As cute as the story is, and, and it is a cute story. It's a neat story. It's, it's God, God put together a wonderful story for us. It, it provides wonder and so forth when he was born. But yeah, it's all geared toward what did Jesus come for? He came to provide salvation for us. And the way he was going to provide that salvation for us was by dying on the cross. You remember the, the Christmas song, Mary, Did You Know? Mary, did you know that this baby was going to come and do that? Did you know that this baby was coming so that he could die on the cross? So you see the different emotions that are there. I think it's just like the emotions that you would find in the story of Benjamin. But there's a couple different emotions for the Christmas story. Now, think about us in our spiritual journey. Uh, we, we've got a couple different emotions there. On the one hand, every single one of us have had our hearts open to the gospel uh, because God decided to work in our hearts. God decided to work in our hearts and to, to show us what the gospel of the Lord Jesus is. And it's up to us to respond to that and so forth. But God has opened our hearts, opened our eyes. So that there, there's a joy in that. There's a joy in thinking, wow, God decided he wanted me, you know. Yeah, I had to respond to his message and so forth. I, I, I had to place my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it all is because God decided to get a hold of me and open my eyes so that I could see the story. Okay? Uh, and, and so there's joy in that. But then it also brings up the, the reminder that the reason all that had to happen, because I'm a sinner. Because I chose to not walk with God. Every single one of us 
are sinners. We were sinners before we come to the Lord Jesus. We actually still are sinners until he uh, ultimately glorifies us and changes that. But, but we, we were sinners and, and, and so forth. But even now that we've come to the Lord Jesus, we continue to sin, right? We continue to do things. Even though we can follow God and hopefully I'm sinning less today than I was the other day. I, I heard a phrase recently that where someone said, being a Christian doesn't make me better than you are. Being a Christian makes me better than I was. And, and that should be, that's the, the path we're taking, right? As, we, as the Lord changes our hearts, as the Lord gives us spiritual life and the Holy Spirit works in us to understand spiritual truth, we're growing and we're learning. But we still sin. We still struggle with sin. And each one of us could have times when we might backslide. Fall away from the Lord, right? Uh, and I don't mean fall away from him completely, but, it, but not be interested in walking with him right now. And, and we can each have a, sometimes it's a quick thing, where maybe we just, uh, for, for a day or two, we just kind of get in that mood, and then, then we repent, and, and we walk with the Lord again. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it, it goes longer. Well, what happens? God allows consequences in our lives, much like what he did with Jacob. He allows the consequences to be there. You remember the story in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11? We quite often use that passage for communion. And, and uh, it's where Paul explains how, how we do communion, where the bread and the, the wine are, equals the Lord, or reminds us of the Lord's body. But he also goes on to say, you need to search your heart on these, because there are some among you that have been taken this flippantly. And have been acting like it was nothing. And he says, God will discipline you. He says, in fact, there's some of you that have even fallen asleep, which is a Christian term for dying. Some of you, the Lord even took you early from this earth because you weren't following him. You weren't walking with him. So, so sin has consequences. Um, I think of the Hebrews chapter, I want to say chapter 12, where God talks about disciplining us as his children. And, and he even goes on to say, look, if you're, if you're not disciplined when, God, when, when you're walking in sin for a while, that's just a sign that you're not one of God's children. If you really are God's children, he'll take you to the woodshed once in a while. He'll spank you. The Bible word is chastise, but we all get that, right? And, uh, and, and God will work on you when you do it. So sin still creates issues for us, and it brings God's judgment Maybe judgment's not the right word there, because when we think of judgment, we think of God uh, judging sinners in an ultimate sense and sending them to hell. But in our case, it's more discipline. God disciplines us as a loving parent would. Sometimes you need to be spanked. Sometimes you need to be put in a corner. Sometimes you need to have privileges withdrawn. What, whatever, whatever he decides to do, and we remember doing those things with our kids as well, but God may have to do that. Well, what we need is revival, much like what Jacob found. Jacob finally decided, I can't do this anymore. I'm making a mess of my life. I need to turn back to God. Well, we find the same story offered to us in the New Testament. In uh, 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we, if we uh, confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We need to turn to the Lord. We need to admit those things. We need to repent of those things. It's not enough to just be sad that you're a sinner and you got caught. We actually need to repent. We need to do something about it. Um, it's not enough if you're outside working. We, we got horses. We're outside working with our horses, and sometimes you got to go clean the stalls, and sometimes you get stuff on you. You know, you, you, you know what that is, Jerry? You know what that's like, don't you? By the way, happy birthday, Jerry. Today's your birthday, isn't it? Happy birthday. But sometimes you get stuff on your hands. Okay, mom calls you in. It's time to come in and go to eat. She says, your hands are filthy, and you're like, Oh, I'm sorry. I got stuff all over me. Okay, where's my sandwich? It's not enough to be sorry. You need to go wash your hands. You need to go wash your boots. Take your boots off. Don't you hate that when you, your stuff in your boots is way back in the back part of the house? You should have taken them off when you came in, right? That, that sort of thing. But you need to do something about it. At Lynn's uh, family's meat market, uh, they used to do uh, chicken. Now they just do uh, beef and pork. But they used to slaughter some chickens. And there was one lady there. She's an interesting lady. I, I loved her. Yeah, she's an interesting lady. But, but she would, what she would do, she'd be the one that would be butchering the chicken. She'd poke them down in a little cone. Her heads are there, and she'd take care of it. And, uh, and then she would take the feather, and there's feathers and junk all over her. Well, th this was before my time got there. But my understanding was when it came time to launch, for lunch, she would just kind of push stuff out of the way. 
and then get her lunch out there and eat her lunch. Isn't that nasty sounding? I don't know about you. It's like, go wash your hands. Go wash your face. Clean your glasses so you can see what you're eating or something. I don't know. But uh, it's not enough to just be sorry. You got you to gotta turn to the Lord, admit that, that, yeah, you're dirty, and then do something about it. And now the Lord has ultimately done something about it. He's provided for your salvation. Your sins are forgiven, but your sins are still affecting you. Clean them up. You know, uh, repent uh, before the Lord. And uh, that, that's what we see this story here. And, and I really believe that the story of Jacob teaches us that. The story of, of Benjamin. What name are you going to give the child? Either a name that reminds you of the sadness or a name that reminds you of the joy. Well, we think of the Lord Jesus at Christmas. And there is great joy, but there's a tinge of sadness because we know what's coming. We know that it's there. Now, even that sadness is joy because we know it provides for us for our salvation. You know, I remember thinking as a kid, sometimes I'd watch, I'd watch stories of, of the crucifixion and I think, God should just come down here and zap them all and let them know you can't do this to my son. But what would have happened if God would have done that? My salvation would not have been paid for. Jesus would not have taken my penalty. He had to do that. So that God can still keep his word. God can still judge as he's supposed to. God can still be holy and take a stand against sin and yet be merciful and offer us salvation. That's what the Lord offers for us. So, so we get those, those contrasting emotions as Benjamin had. Well, the question is, is where do each of us stand right now? As far as walking with the Lord, am I, and am I allowing the sadness of my sinful choices to mount up and mount up and mount up, me keep going down those wrong roads, or am I willing to uh, repent before the Lord and, 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 and admit those things to the Lord and ask the Lord to help me to overcome those things and then to take steps to move away from those things. That's what repentance is, a change of mind, a change of direction. And we need to work on that this Christmas. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the story of Jacob, how he follows you, or at least in the end he did. Thank you, Father, that the scriptures are open and honest enough to show us someone and all the time that they didn't follow you, and yet what it led to and how he eventually did turn to you. Thank you for that. I pray that you'd help each one of us to mirror that as the Lord Jesus came at Christmas, joyful time, but he came for Easter and Good Friday where he gave his life on the cross. Uh, may we turn from our sin and walk in the joy and the forgiveness that you offer. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen.